This is this is prequel. Okay. Uh, are any of you in here familiar with or use the pause or resiliency by John Eldridge? It's a, you can get it on your phone. My wife and I listen to that every morning, every night. But there's a little, it's a rhythm uh, for spiritual connection and so forth. Uh, and the little phrase which we pray multiple times a day is, Lord Jesus, I give everything and everyone to you. So you start worried about something, you, you pray it. And that comes from Jesus, where he said, uh, all you labor and are heavy laden, come unto me, and I will, you will find rest. Learn of me, I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Okay, so it's not just, oh, I'm thinking about it, but deeper than that. And you can get that at John Eldridge, and you can do put in pause or put in resiliency. And it's a morning, evening, Discipline for 30 days, I think, and by then you begin to get, we're listening to it for a second time, actually, so. and happened with me, uh, unsolicited testimony, <laughs> uh, my blood pressure went down, I'm not carrying all that stuff around, and somebody else told me that as well, so let it go to God, simplicity. Okay, a uh, couple things uh, before we start, a couple more people probably be coming in. Uh, and again, this is prequel material. It's, it's not in your book. But did you realize what happened in the last 10 days? Uh, the first artificial intelligence worship service was conducted in Germany. So you see that? I didn't read the story, but I saw it. Yeah. So it was put together by artificial intelligence. There were four, they call them, there were characters, avatars, or chatbots, or I, it's a whole new language I don't even understand, but they did a whole service of prayers and music and preaching and whatever else, uh, but that preacher who was reviewing it uh, said, I know your preachers are wondering, you know, how does that affect me? And his summary was, uh, you don't have to worry about your job. <laughs> so the point being, it was monotone, it was obviously not reacting to the audience at all. There was something who said that was funny, and the audience laughed. Well, if you're a live speaker, you go, oh, you know, or at least recognize it. The bots went on, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, like, so, she said, don't worry about your job. <laughs> you're going to have it. But anyway, first one, and I think it was at every three-year conference in Germany of Lutherans, uh, who try to keep up with current cultural challenges or something along the way. But anyway, that's free, and it's worth every bit <laughs> that you paid for it. So, uh, I do want to say a serious thanks, as I was thinking about it, uh, for you pivoting so quickly to get signed up for this class. I know the announcement I did only a week before, and you cleared your calendar, and I'm, I'm blessed, impressed by that, uh, and in summer, uh, to make it happen, we got mixed up on what Sunday it was going to be. But thank you for doing that. And I was saying, it, this is kind of like a, a, maybe you can view it as a summer intensive course. If you've ever done any graduate work or try to catch up with a class or something, you do a six-week intensive or a two-week intensive. Uh, maybe you can think of it uh, that way. And uh, this is kind of a graduate level course in God and possessions, God and finances, God and material things along the way. We obviously pray that it will be beneficial for you. So, word of prayer. We'll jump into it. Just had a room full at 9 o'clock, and they were bread and bushy tail by about 9.30. <laughs> no, they got their coffee in. Uh, but glad to have you here. And if there are a couple more come in, we'll make room for them along the way. Uh, Father in heaven, again, I thank you for these uh, folks who are trying to pursue becoming obedient uh, to what you have for them, and we're all on that journey of trying to uh, hear from you about being an obe obedient son or daughter. So I pray this, uh, these classes would be a part of that as we look into your word and ask your spirit to be our teacher and begin to apply to our life the things that we have learned. So uh, I know you're gracious and loving God and you want the best for us, and we, uh, we are, we're just 
grateful, blessed beyond beyond measure, uh, the way you take care of us. And thank you for these classes that are part of our journey this summer. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so pursuing financial freedom, earning and spending. Just a quick review from last week uh, to pick up. This is the what's often called the Golden Circle by Simon Sinek from a TED Talk in 2008, where he said, you, we usually start from the outside in, what do I need to do, how do I do it, then why am I doing this, where it is much more motivational to start from the inside of the why. And so we apply that to the why of generous living. Why would we want to be generous in a couple of things? One, faithful management of our resources brings eternal rewards. So what does that mean? It means, as uh, the book that I showed last week, uh, A Life God Rewards, Bruce Wilkinson says that uh, everything we do here on earth has implications for our eternal life in the future. Not eternal life now, but it, life in eternity. It, uh, as the video uh, showed last week, God is watching what we do with our pie, how we divide it up. Uh, and it is God's pie, the title of the video. And what did the, uh, what did the guy down the table say when the guy ended up with nothing left to give to God? What did he say? God brought the pie. What are you doing? How could you not have anything left for God? So kind of a nice humorous way to talk to talk about the topic. Secondly, uh, our ge here's, the, here's the deep theology in it, and the, you'll see the subtitle on your cover, front cover. This is a theology of generosity that we're talking about for these six weeks. Our generous living reflects the great generosity of our God. When you come down to it, when we give, whether it's here at a church or to missionaries or your compassion child or whatever it might be, clean water for orphans in Somalia, it is about helping there. But it is more, as we'll see on a video today, uh, it is about uh, being a reflection of the character of God. Uh, if we, we may often say in our hearts, I would like to become more like Christ. I would like to become more godly. I would like to you know, be more obedient to God. We don't normally go to uh, what I'll suggest in a moment. We might say, I need to pray more. I need to read my Bible more. I need to be more faithful in church. I need to serve more. I need to. Well, I would suggest maybe we need to be generous like Jesus was or God was. We might become more godly by being generous and reflect the generosity of our God. <clears throat> the phrase that we uh, use here that captures this course, what we want for you, that's the biblical posture of God in us. What he wants for us, not what he wants from us. We used a verse of Psalm 50 last week, uh, which said, if I had a need for a bull or a goat, I would not ask you, because I own everything. <laughs> That's kind of, why, why would I have to come to you? It is not what God wants from us. He wants us to prepare for an eternal life uh, with him for all eternity, with all of the blessings that he wants to give. This is a quote from Dave Ramsey, live like no one else today so that you can live like no one else tomorrow. Actually, that's not exactly the way Dave Ramsey said it. I reworded it. I think it's better than the way he says it with all due humility. Uh, but there's another word which his, he has begun to say. If you listen to him at all, he's added another word. Before I put it up, uh, or is that already in your book? Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is the word give. Well, uh, God is working on Dave Ramsey's heart. He's a Christian. Uh, and unapologetically so on his program. He says, you, Financial Peace University, you can't have peace without having the, prin the Prince of Peace in your life, who is Jesus Christ, and I honor him for that. But he is picked up on not just getting out of debt so you can live like no one else with your jacked up truck or your, you know, you're going to Cancun every week or whatever it is you do, but to give like no one else uh, tomorrow. So good for him. Uh, he's beginning to see the light along the way. Our key verse, uh, do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't do it the world's way. We'll pick up on that theme a time or two uh, in the lesson today. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many of you have version app of the Bible on your phone? Anybody? Yeah, a few. Yeah, I do. We use it regularly. 
and I think it was 2020, this verse, out of all of the verses, I don't know how many hundred there are in the Bible, of all of the verses in the Bible, Romans 12, 2 was searched more than any other verse. I don't know how many million times. You just think of the hunger that was out there for people to say, how do I live? Well, don't conform to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you're going to find out, as we talked last week, pretty good promises at the end, good, pleasing, and cross out perfect, complete will. It, it is a plan that will take you to the end, and it will be good for you. So, the cycle of financial stewardship is simply earning and spending. And here's a question I have for you to talk back to me. Uh, because God did not have to follow this plan for all of humanity. Where in the Bible can you think of instances where God did not provide for people through the earning, spending, financial cycle, financial stewardship cycle. Yeah. Uh, what, what was it? Manna yeah, okay, I couldn't see where it's gone. Yeah, manna, sure. 40 years, I'm going to show you a verse, the next uh, slide will come up. Uh, manna in the wilderness, there was no work, in, oh, the work to go out and pick it up, you know, but it wasn't 40 hours and a paycheck or whatever. Uh, so obvious, huge illustration there. It took over a whole nation for 40 years. Okay, what else? Old Testament or New Testament? God is not bound by the earning, spending cycle. When Elijah beat up on the 350 prophets of Baal, and then he went into depression, and he's out by the, the brook Cherith or Cherith or something, how did he get fed? The birds. the birds brought in need. God is not limited to going to work and punching the clock. Okay, New Testament stories that uh, more than one time, God providing what for 4,000 and 5,000 people? Yeah, lunch. They didn't turn in a pay stub to get their free lunch. No, God provided. So my point is God was not bound by a working, earning cycle that we'll look at in a moment. Uh, so there, there's got to be some reason behind it, and that's what we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, here's a verse in Deuteronomy. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet, and they got free food every day. I mean, what a life <laughs> in the desert. Uh, so, just think about what you're wearing today. How would you like to do that for 40 years? <laughs> Not too inviting. But God said, I'll take care of you. You know, you'll have food and clothing and shelter, whatever, along the way. So, here's the cycle. Working, earning, spending. Uh, that God has overlaid on our life. And I want to take a look at these different pieces as we proceed in the class. Starting out with this. God looks very seriously upon how we handle our wealth. I was listening to a podcast this week uh, called Seed Time Money, and a young couple on there were discussing about how their kids, and I think they have three kids, are uh, they always whine about getting tests or exams or pop quizzes at school. Like, oh, I hate that. And they're trying to retrain the thinking of their kids to... Actually, it's not to see whether you pass or fail and you should you'd be shamed by it. It is to see how you're doing. You know, how much math do you know? How much history do you know? How much civics do you know? Or science or whatever it is. And that's really what God does in giving us the earning, spending, uh, the work, earning, and spending cycle. Uh, he says, how are you doing at work? How are you doing at earning? How are you doing at spending? And as somebody has said, uh, our possessions can be either a test or a testimony. You know, we get graded, as we saw at the end of the uh, video last week. God looks very seriously on handling our wealth. And here's the sobering verse in Luke 16, 11, where it says, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? That's a sobering, sobering verse. That if it is God at the end of the table watching how we divide up the pie, as we saw last week, and he says, how you do will determine what I can trust you with. How can you be trusted with true riches? Now, up until like a year ago, uh, at this point in the class, I would stop and say, okay, uh, you well-grounded, uh, biblical people at Fellowship Bible Church, 
uh, what is true riches? God says you can't be trusted with true riches. What is true riches? And so I would ask you this morning, what do you think true riches are? Eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, that's a true riches. Yeah. Blessed to bless others. Okay, we're working on it. Now, about, I think it was a year or so ago, this came across my view. A book on true riches. <laughs> okay. And that's why I've listed down here the four, the four things uh, that you see in that little list. And the riches are the last word, where the first one is moving from pride to gratitude. Is that what it says? Do I have that on? Yeah, from pride to gratitude. What does that mean? It's not the I, me. I got this job. I got the promotion. I drive my car. I da, da, da. No, it is God. I am so grateful that you give me work to do that provides for my family, etc. From anxiety to trust. So you can under, underline the last word in each one of those, and those are the true riches. Somebody came up after the last class, and uh, he said, I, I said to my wife, he never told us what the true riches were. So apparently, I, I thought I did, but it's the last word, okay? Gratitude, trust, from anxiety to trust. Uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. What's the next phrase? I don't need it. I shall not want. I need nothing from trust, anxiety to trust. Covetousness to contentment. We'll look at some verses about Paul. I've learned to be content. And from indifference to love. And remember I told you about the couple going to uh, the three-star Michelin restaurant last week? Remember that? How much did they pay for lunch? $2,000. Okay. And uh, I, guess, I guess that applies like the last one here. You know, it's that. And somebody, I know some, one of you said, well, maybe they were generous with the other the rest of their money. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, wow, how did God think about that? You know, indifferent to the needs of somebody getting the gospel of that 2000 or some child getting clean water, you know, somebody finding Christ along the way. Uh, it's part of the journey we're on in the exam, the pop quizzes that God gives to us. Uh, for, I've got some here that I have a verse or two on. Uh, Pride to gratitude, your heart will become proud, you will forget the land, the Lord your God. You may say uh, to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, 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 me. But remember, the Lord your God is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So it's moving to a gratitude posture rather than a pride. And the other ones, I won't go down the list, but you have the verses there. Uh, and we'll see some of those verses in, in the slides ahead of us here today. Now this chart... It's a little small, but it is actually a message just in the green column and the red column. And let me give you a little background. There's a pastor by the name of Brian Clute, who every year surveys a few thousand people. In this case, it was 5,444 Christians who describe themselves as tithers or non-tithers. Now, next week in the giving lesson, we're going to talk about tithing. One lady who was going to come to this class uh, was talking to her mother, and she and her mother said, you ask him if he's going to talk about tithing. I said, tell her I'm going to talk about tithing. <laughs> so these are people who self-describe tithers. And there's, there's stuff behind that, too. But on the left column, the ones who said we tithe, on the right column, uh, we don't tithe. And just look at the uh, statistics. Uh, Debt-free, 28 versus 13, more than twice. Hole on a mortgage, uh, about half versus two-thirds. Making car payments, over over one-third, about a quarter here. So you go down this list, you know, credit card bills, don't pay them off every uh, 30 days. 20% double if you're a non-tither. Uh, assets, 3641, or debts rather, debts, uh, 3641. Uh, debts over 50,000, 1525. Uh, the green column is obviously a better financial position. The red column is a worse financial uh, through which it's hit the ground. Uh, so what is the takeaway? What's the general takeaway from this chart without getting way into the weeds? God blesses a cheerful giver. 
yeah. And somebody say, you, you can't outgive God. It's not a quid pro quo, you know, like I don't give to get. But there is something about this being trustworthy with riches and being trusted with more. Okay, sir. You know, tithing brings to your mind that there's a priority in your, in your mind about how you use your money. Exactly. You have to, if you're tithing, you know that I am obligated myself or committed myself to give this much to God. Therefore, I can just spend everything I have on some kind of thing. Yeah. You're not going to end up with the God's pie thing with God sitting at the end of the table and no pie left for him. Because you put a priority on it. Yep. yep. It reminds me of what Solomon said. The barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Yep. Yeah. God is a generous God. Where we started last week. Exactly. Exactly what it thinks. So, I remember reading in a book. Uh, the title of the book, by the way, was Simplify. I don't know if Sam used it, but uh, there were, it talked about two guys in there who were young guys in their 20s, and they both wanted to be a millionaire, to have their 40, whatever it was. And the one guy, they're both Christians, and the one guy said, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be faithful, and I'm going to tie to God and then trust him to build my wealth. The other guy said, you know, no. I'm going to use everything I have to build wealth, and then I'll be generous with God uh, when I get up to a million dollars or whatever it is. And the little summary of, of that in the book was, uh, each guy thinks the other guy is stupid. Well, that's kind of the chart up here, right? The world says it's stupid to give away money. However, the stats are there. You will come out better, and again, because God can trust us, not because he said... I, I'm the little rock in your palm of your hand that I rub, and you can get out, get everything you want. That's not the point of it. Long way. Okay, Jesus knew the challenge we would have, the potential risk of dealing with our material wealth. I mean, look at the setup in this verse. No one can serve two masters. God sets up just one thing against God. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. What does he set up? You cannot serve both God and money. He does not say you can't serve God in time. You can't serve God in family. You can't serve God in your job. You can't serve God in some other thing that we would put on the list. He said it's about money. Actually, the original word was mammon, and I heard somebody unpack that. And he said this is what is in the word mammon, spirit of the age. Spirit of the age, what does that mean? Well, it's right in Romans 12, too. Don't be conformed to the practices of this world. Uh, and if you do that, you're going to set up, uh, set yourself against God, and you can't serve both God and the spirit of this age. Do not be conformed to this world and its values along the way. And by the way, uh, just something I th think of here. Uh, in the four soils, remember the spreading the seed, there are four soils, the last one is good, but the one before that, said it did take place, but anybody remember what choked out the good seed? Riches of this world, bingo, there you go, there's a repeat. You can't do the riches of this world. It's actually, then it's a the deceitfulness of the riches of this world. Boy, if I could just be a millionaire, if I could get on the top of the pile, according to the world, I'd have it made. Not so. Okay, over 2,350 verses in the Bible have to do with our finances and possessions. And again, think about the counterintuitiveness of going to the Bible for, na for financial counsel. If somebody came to you, your brother-in-law or whoever, and said, we're really having trouble with our finances. What do you think we should do? Uh, where would most of us think maybe we would give advice to do what? Just randomly. What, what comes to your mind? Stock market, but not now. <laughs> What's that? Stock market, but not now. <laughs> yeah, stock market. Yeah, invest better. Okay, what else? So this <laughs> yeah, okay, we could give them some pieces of it along the way. But in, intuitively, we don't say, let me share a verse with you. Like Romans 12, 2. Yeah. You do it God's way, it's going to be good, pleasing, and perfect. But God knew, as we'll see in a moment, the challenge we would have 
in dealing with our finances, 2,350 verses talk about it. The Bible is full of it from beginning to end. In fact, he talked more about material wealth than prayer, heaven, faith, hope, all of those. Uh, God talked more about money. In fact, and thankfully I'm not in charge of preaching schedule around here, but, but if, if, uh, if the preaching schedule around here were on the same percentage basis that God, that Jesus preached about money, how often would there be a message on our finances and possessions? What do you think? Once a month. It is, yeah. It's about one-fourth of Jesus' teaching is on money and possession. And what would the congregation say if every four, every four weeks we're getting a money message? We're not coming on that side. That's all they talk about around here is money. Well, go talk to Jesus. <laughs> he did. Anyway, life is interesting, funny. Uh, God looks for faithfulness in managing his possessions. He looks for faithfulness. And that's not a new message to us. Uh, Here's a verse. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. We all want to hear that first phrase, well done. Uh, I will put you in charge of many things. Okay, we need to stop there. What do we get for doing a good job, according to this verse? More work. <laughs> More work. Like, I thought the game was retirement. What kind of a deal, God, are you setting up here? You do a good job down here? Guess what? I got more jobs up here. What do we call Wednesday in the work world? Hump day. Hump day. Why is it called that? Called that? If we can just get there, <coughs> we can slide into the weekend. What is Friday called in the work world? Well, it's two different things. If you're a good Christian and watch your language, you say, thank goodness it's Friday. If you're less respectful, you say, thank God it's Friday. T-G-I-F, right? Why is that? I am a slave to this pit that I work in, and I hate it. You see a statistic in a minute. So, okay, let's figure out, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, how would you like to work, work harder? What's the missing piece that we don't think about in here? You're not working harder. God blesses you. Let me say it again. You're not working harder. God blesses you. Okay, it'll be a blessing. That That is true, and it's the direction we're heading. Good comment. Yep. What makes work so hard here on earth? The sin quotient. The tough people to work with. To satisfy what's demanded of us by the world system. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We are working in this world system which is so dark and corrupted and, you know, it's just a challenge every day. But when we get to heaven, that's going to be taken out and service is going to be a joy. And we will delightfully work harder for Jesus who gave his all for us. Okay. Uh, at least that's a promise. We get to work harder. Uh, Jesus said there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. He called him in and said, what do I hear about you? Uh, give an account of your management. You cannot be manager any longer. Again, a sobering verse. If we don't manage God's resources well, then we can't be trusted with more. And it's not a health, wealth, prosperity not what I, the Bible teaches and what I'm teaching here. That's a false doctrine. Uh, it is just a management. If you then, if you uh, if you had kids growing up and they come to the, the, the place where they can drive and now they want to go, can I borrow your car? Well, what are you going to say as a mom and dad? Yeah, yeah if what? You're home by you take time. care of it. Well, yeah, if you're home by whatever. <laughs> but if you take care of it, okay, it's no different with God. He owns the stuff. We say, hey, could I use this? Yeah, but I'm going to watch how you're doing. You're sitting at the end of the table. Okay, a uh, little video. If I can get the music with it this time. I didn't last time. There we go.
obviously the uh, answer to the question they pose, what if this were the plan all along? And the answer is, it was. It was the plan all along, that God blesses the, us that we could be a blessing to others. Uh, Jesus is quoted, in, interestingly, in Acts 20, 35, and it's a verse we all know. It is more blessed to give than to receive along the way, and that is what it's all about. So let's look at some things uh, about work. 92% of people who go to work are unhappy, don't like their jobs, and can't, quit, and can't uh, wait to quit or retire. Uh, how many of you have taken Strengths Finder or know that? Yeah, a few of you maybe. Uh, actually, I think that quote comes from them. Uh, it's a Gallup product. Uh, and they say that's because we are usually placed in our work where where we don't have we don't use our strengths we have to overcome our weaknesses let me give you an illustration of it uh, say that this is a group of, the, of salespeople for the company and uh, Jay did I get the right name <laughs> Jay has sold more than widgets than anybody here and so we want to honor him and what do we uh, promote him to in our company Anymore. Sales manager, <laughs> more pay, yeah. more pay, and he gets a window in his office. Okay. And so, what does Jay do now? He reads all of our reports on sales and has to sit at his desk and he has to add them all up and report to the boss of why somebody is not doing it or whatever. And he hates it. He likes the pay, he likes the office, but he <laughs> likes to be with people. What's he left? Doing what he hates. So that's how you get to the ninety percent that. Uh, the, the Gallup work, if you're familiar with it at all, millions, billions of dollars have been spent by corporate uh, saying, Jay, you're not personable enough. We're going to send you to a seminar for $3,000 to become more personal. It <laughs> doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. God has made us with his strengths, if you know that system at all. So 92%, not doing what they enjoy doing and do it naturally. God's view of work, it is good. It was part of a perfect creation. Actually, God worked to put creation together. Uh, now, a question again for you biblically literate people. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. That is in Genesis 2. Where does sin come into the equation? Genesis what? Not a hard question. Three. The next chapter, the whole thing went south. Work was good. They enjoyed picking the fruit off the tree and you know, whatever they did to tend and care for it. Uh, it's sin that messed it up, as we mentioned before. Work is commanded in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, Exodus 29 and 10 is, uh, I think, the fourth commandment. And we usually uh, concentrate on the last part of it. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath. So we think about Sabbath, but actually look at the first half of the verse. What are we supposed to do for six days? Work. God's cycle. Uh, New Testament, even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. And this is an actual story that comes out of one of the lead pastors here at Fellowship that uh, one of his children graduated from high school and just uh, wouldn't go to work. He thought, I'd rather go skiing out on Beaver Lake with my friends. And this went on during the summer, didn't heed his, his parents' admonition. And finally, by the end of the summer, he said, okay, here's the deal. You don't eat at our table anymore. I don't know, what is that, tough love <laughs> or reality <laughs> along the way? Even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. Unwilling to work, you don't eat here. So, practicing. Now, uh, I think I told you last week that you, you were the first people to use the new up-to-date notebook for this class. Did I tell you that? And you looked at the 2023 version. Guess what? It's obsolete. Because <laughs> I found some stuff that uh, I want to, in the next minute or two, unpack here. You may want to get your phones out because this is not in your book and this is a, a very interesting slide. But let me give a little preface to that. And it is, uh, how many of you know the name Seth? Godin, G-O-D-I-N. Anybody? Okay, he's a brilliant guy, 62 years old, written 20 books. He's into computers, 
artificial intelligence and a whole lot of stuff. Very high demand, in demand for speaking uh, in, the, in our culture right now. But I was listening to an interview with him, and he said, here's what's happened to, to work in a period of time, you know, 100, 200 years. It used to be I would work to grow tomatoes so I could give you some tomatoes and you had beans and you would give me some beans. So we helped each other thrive, however that worked out. Then it changed when we got into the Industrial Revolution and into mass production uh, that workers were not there to help individuals thrive. They were there to help the company thrive. And he used Henry Ford as an illustration. And he said that work, as far as the people were involved, they were demoted to machines. How many widgets can you get off the end of the assembly line? And there's very little fulfillment in that. And so today, the workforce, we're going to get to that in a moment, today's workforce uh, is being told, like, largely, uh, come and work for our company and work for us for 35 years. We'll give you the gold watch and we'll give you the, you know, the party and go on with your life. They go, no thanks. That's not me. And then uh, it had, I was talking with our daughter about this, who's a HR director at a medium-sized company in Bentonville, now known as People and Culture. <laughs> office, but uh, she was saying, "Hey, Dad, you got to you got to take a look at this and show your your class." So here it is. Uh, in the past, the concern was about my paycheck. How much am I going to get paid? Today, the question being asked by the younger generation is, "What's my purpose in life, and is that going to help me get there?" My satisfaction used to be, "Do you have health benefits, paid time off? How much is it?" Blah 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 blah. Uh, not now so much. It is, how are you going to help me develop as a person? My development is more uh, important than the health insurance or whatever, maybe. Uh, it used to be my boss. I just do what you do, make widgets, and go home, whatever. No, I want a coach because I'm on a journey in my life, and I want somebody talking to me, not just at an annual review, thumbs up, thumbs down. No, I want a connection along the way. And as an aside, our daughter is probably now in the fourth or fifth year of trying to change the culture of this company she works for and two words that uh, she and I have talked much about the difference between being an engaged employee and an engaging employee an engaged employee you say hey did you make widgets today yeah I made widgets today an engaging employee says how about your team do you know what's going on in their life because that's more important than getting the widgets though the widgets have to be done uh, weaknesses versus strengths, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, used to be, do I have a job? Uh, now it's more, what about my life? Am I getting where I want to go uh, with my life? So changing demands of the workforce. We are living in a very interesting time. A number of us in this room are off the end of the <laughs> conveyor belt in, in retirement, whatever. But uh, the rest of you who are living with this, and if you do any conversation, I saw a statistic recently, the college graduates have been hired since, uh, were hired last summer, 30% of them are fired within 30 days for non-performance. We'll talk more about that. Work develops character. Uh, if you see slaves in the Bible, just put employees in. It's in his employer-employee thing when you see slaves and masters, but employees Obey your earthly employers and everything and do it. That's sometimes hard. Not only when their eyes on you, when they're watching, curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. In other words, our work should be seen as a gift moving from pride to gratitude in the true riches. Uh, it should, we should have gratitude in our heart and remember it is God who has placed us there. Work is God's means of support. Uh, did, I, did we miss one, Lori? Do you want to get it before that? Okay. Work is God's means of support. Uh, I want to look at just the first half of this verse, and uh, then we'll see the last half in a minute. But anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful of their own hands. So it flows right into the work. If you've been living off of stealing from somebody else, then you need to go to work. We got that. Uh, work can and should bring satisfaction and fulfillment. 
And that blends right into where the changing demands of the workforce. I want this to be fulfilling for me. I uh, had coffee with a guy who was actually one of the leaders out of New Life Ranch <clears throat> uh, this week. He'd gone to a seminar. And the new word in the whole employer-employee uh, field is you need to not only give time, give time and energy, but encourage people having a side gig. Okay. Now that... It, <laughs> Some of you know probably what that's about. Some of you may be doing it right here. Uh, when I heard that, I was reminded there was, do you know that the fellowship has a resident program here where a year after college you can serve on staff 20 hours a week and whatever. I was talking to one of those guys three or four years ago or more, and I go, hey, you know, you're working here 20 hours, so what else do you do? He said, oh, I trade cattle. I go, you what? He's a 20, you know, 22 year old living here in the village. I mean, not, doesn't have any cattle around. Well, oh, no, my grandfather taught me to trade cattle online. I never see them. I buy, you know, 400 calves and I sell them over here, and they're in a feedlot in Texas or somewhere. I mean, side gigs. That's the day we're living in. The day we're... So, uh, uh, satisfaction and fulfillment. Again, serving wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Uh, Gratitude for your job, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do. God is watching. The same theme we've been on, whether they are slave or free. Seeing our, our job as God-given, and we are grateful for that. Here's the rest of, our, <laughs> rest of the verse. Uh, work is God's way to provide for your family and for others in need. Now, I see Ephesians 4.28. Again, uh, you'll get more depressed for a moment. Uh, uh, this is the verse which says, you never were intended to spend your whole paycheck. You go, what? Well, read it. It says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but work with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. From our work, whether it's the video we just watched, we are blessed, or from this verse, so that others may benefit from what we have set aside. So, if that be true, let me prod your pure thinking to look at the word steal a little bit more. And what if the stealing is not, say back in that day, oh, you stole my sandals outside my door. Or today, uh, you know, you stole, I stole your lawnmower next door, whatever it is. What if that's not the stealing that's talked about here? But if we spend all our paycheck we have stolen from somebody who's in need that God intended a part of our money to go to. See where I'm saying? See what I'm saying in that? That stealing may not be theft in that sense, but in fact, it is God has blessed us with more than we need for you know heat, light, and rent, food, clothing, and shelter. And God says, set some of it aside because there are some needs out there and I want to bless other people through the blessing that uh, I give to you and you will bless others. Uh, this is countercultural as well. What you earn from working is what God has given you to spend. However, we don't believe that you know, as a culture. And so how do we live above our means? Credit cards. Credit cards is the correct bad answer <laughs> along the way. Because we want people to think that we are working or we're earning more than or whatever it is along the way. Uh, contentment is based on what we earn or have. It is a learned behavior. The Apostle Paul talked about it as well as Solomon. Solomon put it this way, whoever loves money never has enough. Uh, what was it? One of the uh, Rockefellers uh, said, how much more money do you need? What was the answer? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more, Solomon. <laughs> whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Paul said in Ephesians 4, or yeah, Philippians 4, where the chapter I've had a lot, I've had a little. He said, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have a lot. But I have learned the secret of being content. Contentment is not having everything. It's learning to be content with what God has given to us every, in, and every, in, in any and every situation. Well fed or hungry, plenty or want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It is a spiritual journey. And it's in the true riches moving from covetousness to contentment. It is a learned behavior. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. If we can just be satisfied with what God has given to us, 
we'll have peace in our heart. Discontentment is the primary marketing strategy in our culture. Uh, somebody has noted that for every 30 hours of TV you watch per week, you're likely to spend $500 more per year on what you see with the new <laughs> cabbage slicer, you know, the new, the new eyeshadow that you can't buy in the store. You can only get it online, you know, whatever, whatever. There is a relationship to creating discontentment in what we click on and uh, send our credit card number, discontentment. <clears throat> Goes way back to Samuel and trying to get a new king. And the Lord said to Samuel, uh, don't look at the way people look uh, because God looks not at the outward appearance, but uh, God looks at our heart. And that is, that's, in our culture, it's just the opposite. We look at what are you wearing? What did you drive? Where did you go on vacation? On social media, that's part of the whole thing. My, uh, a friend who's an executive uh, just went to visit the pyramids in Egypt. So they sent me a picture of him being on a camel with a pyramid in the background. <laughs> I mean, it said, look, look at me. Look at me. That's where I am. You know, and that's what we're just into that culture so much. Uh, social media just accelerates it along the way. Uh, so we're back to the Romans 12 to do not conform, but be transformed. Don't think like the world. Don't put God up against, uh, you know, your world values because you can't do both. You can't combine them along the way. So uh, extenuating factors. I'm not hard hearted knowing that uh, sometimes there really is minimal opportunity for work, though that's not particularly the case in our culture, though it's a, we had a grandson that just he got out of uh, Southwest Baptist uh, College, Christian College, December a year ago, and just went to work May 1 as a, in tech with a computer science degree, and it's a strange world out there. And anyway, uh, sometimes you can't find the work. Now he's uh, got a great job, and they're taking great care of him. Uh, health accident and infirmity. There was a couple in our community group that in a period of 30 days, the mom, the dad, the son, the daughter, were all in emergency for different reasons. It wasn't a car accident. It was passing out and falling on your head. It was cancer. It was heart. Uh, and we reached out as a community group, and, you know, took an offering for them that night. They were just, just under extenuating factors. Life happens. Uh, that, but there still is the work earning cycle out there we work through. Somebody said, children and work. You don't talk about children. Well, here's at least a, a little glimpse into it, and there's there's uh, more that could be said for sure. A uh, problem in our affluent society, which develops an entitlement mentality. I had a youth pastor who, uh, we did a church plan up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He's There's a seminary in town. I had him as a student youth pastor, and he went to Canada a couple years, came back, hired him back, uh, and he came in to me one day and said, Don, I'm going to recommend to all parents of high schoolers that they don't let their kids work on a job outside of uh, the home. That, that's the right reaction right there. I go, what? What does that? What does that teach them? Yeah, so I said, okay, Alan. I mean, he's a bright guy, good, great man. Great man. Uh, he said, well, here's what I see happening. As soon as the kids go to work, then their grades begin to drop. But further than that, he said, you get the 16 or 17 year old wants to go, wants a job. And so what's the first thing they say to mom and dad? I need a car to get to work. They don't have any money for a car. So mom and dad buy a car. Then they buy the insurance. Then they buy the gas. But he said, worse than that, uh, the kid brings his money home. And because he's being fed and housed and everything, he spends it on video games and going out with his friends. And he said, we are subtly training our kids that all money they make is just for fun. Ah, oh. uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff in there we could unpack. Dave poor, Ramsey poor says, huh? <laughs> poor parenting is going on. Well, yeah, but, but it's, it is, you know, the word endemic is wall to wall. It's wall to wall in our culture. Mm -hmm. That's why you get 30% of people are getting fired in 30 days. Because you know, I don't have to work. I never did have to work. I just had all the goodies you know, from you know, families that have been blessed by God and doing well. It's a pairing issue. You're right. 
entitlement mentality along the way. Okay, how we handle our money is an index of our true character. And the uh, thing to reflect on here is the prodigal son story. My question is, uh, did the prodigal son go bad because he got half of the inheritance? What do you think? My answer is no. <laughs> okay, yeah. and here's why. Uh, that he... It's the next slide here. The more money we have, the more we reveal our character. We just have the money to go do the bad things we wanted to do. In his case, wine, women, and song, rather than conserving it, you know, his half of the farm that he got. It doesn't ruin our character. It shows our character, shows where our heart is along the way. And again, this uh, verse we looked at, God's thoughts are different. We need God's wisdom in this area because he looks at the world differently than we do. And that's why, uh, you know, we have this class and other classes here to have us look at the Word of God and uh, see what he wants us to do with it. Now, the most significant difference in God's view of material wealth, in our view, is that the living Lord is the central focus in a couple questions. One, who is the owner? And we all got that last week. Who owns it all? God. Very good. Then the next question is, what do you want me to do with it? What is your desire? And I will tell from Ray and my, my wife and I's journey, that is a continuing current question and decision we need to make, you know, in this time we're living in right now. God, what do you want me to do with what I have? That is a daily or at least a weekly question. Uh, you're the owner. What do I do with it? And it is a change of our mindset, not the way the world does it but it in fact transformed in our thinking. Now there are only three categories to our spending uh, and they are through giving, into savings, and for fun. Now the first two of you we're going to unpack uh, going ahead from here, but let, I need to describe fun to you and how I use it. Fun it was more fun to drive here than to walk here today. Okay. It is more fun to have lunch than not to have lunch. It is more fun to have vacation than no vacation. So it is in the broader sense of living life. Okay. So fun is broadly, broadly described or defined. And we're, we're going to talk about that going forward. This comes from a secular book. Uh, if there are any people who are salesmen in here, you may be familiar with it. If not, it might be worth a read where he develops a pyramid of when to make the ask for a sale. Uh, pretty good stuff. But he has in that book, to have a balanced financial plan and a balanced life, you must spend, save, and give a part of every dollar. Good advice, but <laughs> it would be good advice for a dyslexic because he's got it backward. <laughs> okay. it, it is uh, every... Uh, have a balanced plan, uh, you must give, save, and spend. And that's where we go from here uh, with our next classes along the way. So, we got a couple minutes here, 1126, and that's our lesson for today on work, earning, spending. Next week we'll do giving, the next week after that we'll do spending, the next week after that we'll do investing. Uh, and then we'll be up to the sixth session, which is the Will and Trust Seminar, and will lead to <coughs> us having the secret handshake to get into a will and a trust, <laughs> which I know many of you are interested in. Oh, as I said, we can't give, we can't talk about generosity without being generous. This is your gift on the way out. Randy Alcorn is a well-known name in Christian generosity. Uh, the book Treasure Principle unpacks Matthew 6, 19, and 20. Do not lay up treasure on earth, where moth and rust corrupt, and thieves break in and steal. But lay up treasure in heaven for yourselves. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where uh, moth and rust don't corrupt, and thieves don't break in and steal. And here's the Treasure Principle. Uh, if you want to act like you've read the book, you can say, yeah, I know what the Treasure Principle is. It's this. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And you've heard it said, 
you never saw a hearse pulling a U-Haul because you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And then later in the book, uh, uh, Randy Alcorn says this, once a person understands that principle, they can't get enough of it. So once we figure out, uh, and he he uses the story of the Confederacy money, we might use cryptocurrency. What if what if we knew that everything was being uh, converted into cryptocurrency by December 31, and we have Y2K only as cryptocurrency? Uh, what do we do between now and uh, December 31? All you can spend on January 1 is cryptocurrency. What would we do? Convert. Convert it. And Randy Alcorn says the true is the same thing with treasure in heaven versus treasure here on earth. And you can't get enough of it. Okay. Anything else? We'll pray and go. Have a great week. Father in heaven, thank you for the just the attention of these people. Thank you that uh, we're looking at divine truth as we unpack these verses and help us to uh, take uh, at least one thing and maybe discuss it uh, with somebody along the way in the car today or family or whatever along the way. Look forward to you watching over us and uh, thank you for your generosity for another week. And we look forward to being back by your grace next week. And we are grateful for the opportunity in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, you're welcome. Great to see you here.